The internet can be a scary place, what with hackers, corporations, and governments out to steal our data. But fear no longer, dear viewer. It is I, YouTuber with a VPN sponsorship. Promising anonymity, privacy, and security at the click of a button, VPNs have become the number one tool for the privacy-conscious consumer. Whether it's NordVPN, ExpressVPN, or Surfshark, the list of VPNs is nearly endless, and every big YouTuber has been sponsored by one or the other. But just how did we get here? Virtual private networks found their origins in the offices of 90s Microsoft, where they allowed employees to connect to a private network virtually through a public network just as if they were physically connected to the private one. Confused? Don't worry, me too. You might be surprised to hear that if we follow Google's search trends, VPNs peaked in popularity way back in 2004 as companies and universities everywhere sought out ways to implement the new tunneling technology. While these kinds of VPNs are still in use in corporate settings today, it wasn't until the 2010s that commercial VPNs really began to see use. This is when we began to see the rise of some recognizable names like Mulvad and ExpressVPN. Perhaps coincidentally, the beginning of the 2010s is also around the same time social media really started hitting the mainstream with the proliferation of Twitter and Facebook, as well as when the idea of data privacy really began to take off. This fear regarding the internet and our privacy was in large part due to the media. In 2010, CNN declared that the internet had ushered in the end of privacy and it was just one outlet of many ringing the alarm bells on the issue. And don't get me wrong, while there is a genuine problem when it comes to our privacy online, I mean, I made a whole video about it that you should really watch, the coverage often left a lot to be desired. Do we even know who is this 4chan? Whether it's due to profit chasing or outright incompetence, news outlets have created a terrifying narrative surrounding our data privacy, and this has spun the public into a bit of a moral panic. And we have a long history of moral panics. From the McCarthy era red scares to the gang media craze of the 80s, it seems like every other week we find a new folk devil to be terrified of. According to sociologist Stanley Cohen, moral panics follow a rough five-stage pattern. Something or someone is identified as a threat to social norms or community interests. For example, people dressed in clown costumes scaring people at night are identified as a pretty clear threat to social norms. Then, this threat is animated by the media. A couple of pranksters becomes a killer clown epidemic. Creepy clown sightings are happening across the country and it's no laughing matter woman claims she was attacked by a man in a clown suit just this morning. Seems as if a new report of a threatening clown pops up by the hour. And the public becomes aroused. Here we have the immediately recognizable moral panicking and mass hysteria. It's America's bread and butter. The fear then mobilizes authorities to take action. In states all across the country, schools were put into lockdown, clown hunts were held, and some cities went so far as to ban scary clown costumes altogether. Finally, the moral panic subsides, social changes are made, and the cycle starts anew with another target. Sociologists have used moral panic theory to prove how mass hysteria is usually a mechanism for social control. While today's folk devils are violent Antifa protesters that are going to run down the suburbs, a few years ago it was inner city gangs. And before that, muggers, satanists, communists, beatniks. And you might be noticing a pattern here. Often, the group that's targeted by the media exists because of conditions produced by the system, like elements of the lower class, vagrants, and political dissidents. Moral panics allow society to address an issue in a way that upholds the status quo instead of getting to the root of the problem. This is the logic of the moral panic. Anyway, what were we talking about again? Oh, privacy. More people than ever before think that data privacy is a serious issue. Pro-privacy movements like hashtag delete Facebook have gained traction and a not insignificant amount of people have begun to regulate their online browsing habits whether it's reducing their social media use or deleting their accounts entirely. 
According to Edison Research, Facebook has lost 15 million users in two years. Our profit-driven system created a surveillance problem for consumers, and in response, a subversive movement was created, but like all the other panics, the solution could only uphold the status quo. Enter the VPN. According to Statista, the market size for VPNs has reached $27 billion. Globally, one in two VPN users utilize VPNs to access better entertainment content by spoofing their location and to circumvent censorship, while one in three use it to keep anonymity while browsing online. These are the global numbers, so in countries like Malaysia and Pakistan, the focus on accessing entertainment and bypassing censorship makes total sense. But in the United States, over 90% of VPN users don't use it to access international content, leaving privacy and anonymity as the number one reason American audiences use VPNs. Which is troubling, because they don't actually help with that at all. If you've seen any YouTuber shill for a VPN, you'll see they get promised as this magic bullet solution for privacy, but they're anything but. While VPNs may have been useful before encryption became widespread, nearly every website now uses encrypted protocols, which gives you the little padlock on your browser, even on public Wi-Fi's. Most of these YouTube sponsorships border on criminal, promising all kinds of things that VPNs just do not do. For most cases, VPNs merely make it so that the burden of trust shifts from the internet provider to the VPN company. And if you think the VPN companies behind the software are reputable, well, I wouldn't be making this video if they were. For one, running a VPN service isn't exactly difficult, and the potential for returns are astronomical, meaning any shady company can spin up a few servers and start collecting $10 a month off unsuspecting users. It's why over the last few years, the number of no-name VPN providers has exploded. It's just a really simple business to operate. But okay, let's say you're smart and stick to the big names like Nord and Express. NordVPN was the first big player to enter the YouTube sponsorship game. Their ads were everywhere just a few years ago, and despite the high praise they got after one of their servers was infiltrated in 2018, they waited nearly a year to alert the press about the incident. While they claim no user information was at risk, the entire situation left Nord users with a sour taste in their mouth. And it shows just how vulnerable you are having just one point of failure for all your data. In another case, Hide My Ass VPN famously cooperated with the US government to catch lulsec hackers after they were involved in a few high-profile hacks. If you're an activist or have any reason to be targeted by a government, these quote-unquote privacy solutions are the last thing you should be using when dealing with sensitive work. Despite this, the false advertising has worked. VPNs make users feel safe and their success is a testament to that. In rebelling against the status quo, the data privacy movement created a market that VPNs could fraudulently capitalize on. Like all the other moral panics, the solution to the problem ended up being the most profitable one. Now that's not to say VPNs are useless because they're not. If you're downloading things you shouldn't be downloading, you should use a VPN. If you want to protect your browsing habits from your internet provider, again, VPNs are a good solution. And there are providers like ProtonVPN and Molvad that have been independently audited and are much more trustworthy than your ISP. I personally would rather ProtonVPN see my traffic than my internet provider. But if you're after privacy, you will not find it in a VPN. As unfortunate as it is, we can't fight the system for just $10 a month. Thankfully, there is a privacy-oriented alternative to VPNs. The Tor network actually has exactly what these YouTube sponsorships promise. And while I won't get too detailed into that here, I think a big reason as to why it hasn't seen the same explosion in popularity is that it can't be monetized in the same way VPNs can. And profitability seems to be what matters most. But what do you think? Do you use a VPN? Let me know in the comments down below.